initially riding on a motorcycle, I mean on a bicycle, then on a scooter, then on a motorcycle, then motorcycle powered me up to ride across the country many times. So, I know the land well. If you feel the land, you know what the land needs for its well-being. It doesn't take a genius to understand that if you watch these in different seasons, this green leaf will turn brown and fall down, where does it go? Not one or two, millions of tons of leaves are falling down. Where does it go? That's the soil, that's the richness of the soil. And millions of animals, wild and otherwise, all of them shit. Hello? Where does it go? That is the soil. Without leaf and human… I mean human also, human and animal excrement, there is no soil. Soil will become sand. So minimum, the United Nations says this, I don't agree with this. United Nations says, for soil to be called a soil, there must be at least two percent organic content. You ask the farmer who puts his… you know, you must see how the farmers with what joy they put their hand into soil mixed with manure and say, wow, it's so rich. You ask them how much should be the percentage, if it is five to eight percent, you will see just about anything grows. But today trees are gone, animals are going to Saudi Arabia. How do you enrich the soil? How? Nearly twenty-five percent of India will become sandy in the next uh, ten to fifteen years' time. By twenty-thirty, it is expected twenty-five percent of India will be not cultivable. So all of you young people who are studying agriculture, I know some of you have to go into government jobs or whatever research and this and that, but too much research and not enough science going into action is no good. As a part of Rally for Rivers, we invited some farmers from… experts from uh, Vietnam. Vietnam is exporting nearly three billion dollars worth of fruit, it's a small country compared to who we are. And all this started only about ten to fifteen years ago. Their fruit quality is much better than ours. Their rice quality is much better than ours. I was uh, in California and uh, all the rice there is from Thailand. I asked, why are you not getting Indian rice? They didn't know. Then I inquired around, why are you not getting Indian rice? We know how to grow rice in India. Then I went about asking, then somebody who knows this matter told me, Sadhguru, Indian rice has no nutrients in it. There's nothing in it except starch. There is nothing in the Indian rice. So in America, we don't want Indian rice because it doesn't have any nutrients. I said, what happened to our rice? Well, <laughs> we grow rice on urea, not on a rich soil. So they are getting rice only from Thailand. Now these Vietnamese experts came, we were looking at… we made small experiments with uh, small groups of farmers. We have multiplied their income somewhere between three to eight times. We thought this is a great achievement. But when they came and we asked them, they said in the last six years, they have multiplied their farmer's income twenty times over. This is unbelievable. How can you do twenty times over? When we asked them, they're laughing at us. They all came to India about twenty-one, twenty-two years ago. They studied in that… Uh, what is that in Delhi, there's an agro institute? <coughs> huh? They studied in that institute. They said, we studied there, we went back and put our knowledge into the land. Your people just earn PhDs. We put it into the land and this is what happened to us. They came here and studied and there they made it happen. We have the knowledge, we have the technology, we have the people, we just don't have a sense. Sense is missing in us. This sense, I want the young people who are doing agriculture, to bring it back, you must bring this science that you're studying back into the land. 
not as a service, this can be a great enterprise. Why I'm saying this is, in terms of latitudinal spread from Kanyakumari to Himalayas, if you see, we have enough latitude in terms of weather, weather patterns, temperatures, rain, everything. We can grow almost anything that anybody grows anywhere on this planet, twelve months of the year. Very few nations in this world can do twelve months agriculture. This is one of those fortunate countries. But today our farmers are committing suicide simply because ad hoc we are doing things. Everything is ad hoc, nothing is planned, nothing is organized, the scale is not there in anything. This is something you can do, we have gotten this going with the government, we changed some of the laws. Young people can go out and form former producer organizations and aggregate thousand, two thousand, ten thousand farmers depending on your capacity. And if you aggregate irrigation and aggregate marketing and the farmer just does farming, you will make a miracle happen in this country. Right now the problem is he cannot invest in technology because the scale is very small, just two acres, three acres holdings, with that kind of holding you can't invest in a big way. Everybody takes loan, everybody puts bore well, everybody has micro-irrigation, which fails anyway after one year. Once the subsidy comes, the micro-irrigation fails. It can only be managed if there is scale. If we put thousand, two thousand acres together, then we can create a scale. This is something young people should take it as an enterprise. It'll be very lucrative and it's very important agriculture is lucrative. If you make a survey right now, you ask these farmers and see how many of them want their children to go into farming. Believe me, it is somewhere between two to five percent, not more. This means in the next twenty to twenty-five years, when this generation passes, we would have lost all ability to grow food. With 1.3 billion people on our hands, if you lose your ability to grow food, you can imagine the disaster you will cause in this country. You are not Dubai or something, you will buy everything from all over the world and eat it here. It's not going to work like that for India. Unless we grow our food, we are finished. But we are heading that way because a child cannot even go to the farm. If a farmer's son goes to his farm, Along with his father, father will be arrested as child labor. On child labor charges, the father will be arrested because he took his eight-year-old son to his farm and both of them are working. With this kind of stupid approach, there is no future for in Indian agriculture. We are trying to change this now. Education policy we are working on because without changing the education policy, we cannot change the situation of the farmer. So, already government has announced that only fifty percent of the time in a school, if children are there for seven hours, only three and a half hours will be focused on academics. Another three and a half hours, they will do sport, agriculture, arts, crafts, music. See, if… if uh, the way these people are singing, just a small bunch left, there was a time the entire village could sing. Now just a small bunch left. Do you think their children are also going to learn this music? No, they are software engineers in Bangalore, already, most probably. I'm saying, we've… we've gotten into this madness, what one person does, everybody must do. It is time that agriculture becomes a prime activity in this country and a lucrative activity. If you don't make it very, very lucrative process, in the next twenty-five years, we will lose our ability to go… grow food in this country. This is something that must happen. So, those of you who are in this agriculture and horticulture, particularly horticulture becomes very, very important. If you want to save this land, why this becomes a problem is, the population and land, the proportions that we have is very unnatural proportion. With this kind of population, if you want to maintain the quality of this land, more food should come from the trees, very, very important. This scratching the earth and growing one, one crop every three months is not going to work for as long term. It's very, very important 
that more food, a lot more food needs to come from the trees. That means horticulture becomes prime. I want you... maybe you have not seen but if you fly from Mysore city to let's say Delhi, you just keep looking down, except for the western gods, you will see the entire country looks like a brown desert. There is no greenery, there are no water bodies. Most of the rivers that you see along the way are only sand rivers. When we were doing rally for rivers, when we asked children to draw or paint rivers, you won't believe most of them painted sand because they have not seen a, f a river flowing full with water, they have not seen. <laughs> there is a video which went viral, this one Marathi girl in, uh, you know, near Mumbai. <laughs> I wish we had something to show you. But uh, this girl, she can speak only Marathi, she gave a speech, twenty minute speech without any paper, nothing. So passionately she spoke, this Sadhguru is saying he's going to revive the rivers, this, that, he talks about a river where he floated out. I don't believe all this. I've never even seen a river on which I can float. <laughs> the way she spoke, this is the future generation, they've not seen a river. We made a survey in Coimbatore city and we found eighty percent of the people below twenty years of age have not seen a river in their life. They've seen it only in the movies or in the pictures. How many of you, this is the first time you're near a river? Being in Karnataka, that should not be the case, but it could be true in Bangalore city. Bangalore city had thousand lakes and three perennial rivers in the city. Today there are eighty-one, forty-one, forty-two of them are just sewage. And the three rivers, nobody is able to trace where they are. They're just gone, maybe your house is sitting on it, maybe there's a shopping mall where we are happy. So, if we don't act now as a generation of people, this land which has nurtured thousands of years of culture and civilization will go through uh, tremendous uh, upheavals in the coming decades if we don't take the right action. Right now we are pushing towards this. I want all of you to be a part of it in some way, in whichever way you can. Please. Karam Sadhguru. Sadhguru, Siddha medicine is more related to spiritual and the environment. And now the Siddha medicine is dying and the medicinal plant also dying. Do you have any plan for Siddha medicine? Well, we have done some work on the Siddha medicine. We are using Siddha medicine very effectively. But the problem that we have found with Siddha medicine is, this problem is there with Ayurveda also, but much more with Siddha. We are finding that the input, the ingredients which go into it, they need to be of a certain quality, which is very difficult to manage. These things a Siddha Vaidya is conscious of. If you pluck the tree in the morning, how it is? If you pluck the leaf in the evening, what is its quality? If you pluck it in summer, what's its quality? If you pluck it, pluck it after rain, what is the quality? All these things, they're conscious, but they're not able to maintain it. We are using Siddha very effectively, but in a small scale. We've been experimenting for over twenty years to increase the scale. But if you stretch the scale, the effectiveness goes down. This is a big challenge. This is where the modern medicine or the allopathic medicine is super effective because they're just chemicals, you can produce any amount of tons and tons of tablets you can produce. But Siddha medicine is not like that, it's very organic and there's an elemental part to it which needs a certain level of expertise for people to be able to use it. There are heavy metals, there is use of mercury in Siddha very effectively. These things need application, it's not like a five-year MBBS you did and there you are. This needs a lot of involvement in application that you need to understand these things.